Greetings all and welcome to Theater Workshop of Owensboro's Trinity Radio Players production of Murder at Yellow Banks. Adapted for radio by Richard Fish from the original story by Brett Mills. Directed by Todd Reynolds and produced by Shane Devon and Tinkertone Studios. The Trinity Radio Players are sponsored by Limestone Bank. A firm financial future starts here. And by Greenwell Chisholm. See Greenwell Chisholm for all your printing and promotional needs. And now, Murder at Yellow Banks. Leather stocking. You may remember the word from James Fenimore Cooper's famous tales, but his immortal Natty Bumpo was fiction, an amalgam of those hardy, wily, restless men who first explored the vastness of the North American continent, who opened it up for the waves of pioneers and settlers coming from the East. Here tonight, we give you a true story, as true as careful research and an understanding imagination can make it. The story of a real leather stocking, our own leather stocking, the first to find and build upon this land we call home today. We take you now to February 24th, 1809. It's a Thursday. The place is the Smethers Home in Yellow Banks, Kentucky, a small settlement on the banks of the Ohio River. William Smethers stares out a front window, looking west along the river, while his wife Mary and his sister Molly pack a basket with food and baked goods. The Smethers' children, Betsy, John, Archie, and young Mary are watching with great interest. Mmm, mmm, that pie sure smells good. Archibald Jacob Smethers, you stay away from that pie. That's a gift for Mr. and Mrs. Barry and their guests this afternoon. Sorry, Mama. Only I thought we were going to be their guests. Don't sass me, Archie. Not today, understand? We're not their only ones. It's high time all you children learned more about being neighborly company. Well, I imagine most of Yellow Banks will be at the Berry Place this afternoon. Is that why Papa's not going with us, Mama? Archie, don't pester your mother with such questions. Your Papa's staying here to tend to the stand today, that's all. Oh, okay, Aunt Molly. Only I thought that... John, please be a help. Get the wagon hitched up, then bring it round front, and take your brother with you. Just both of you mind not to get your good clothes dirty. Yes, Mama. Come on, Archie. I'm coming. Young Mary, you aren't wearing that calico dress. Go change into the one I picked out for you last night. Can't I please just wear this one, Mama? It's my favorite. I know it is, child. That's why it's all faded from the sun and too much washing. You have better clothes, and I don't want folks saying you don't. Now hurry up and change. Betsy, stop fretting over your dress. You look right nice, doesn't she, Molly? She does for a fact. Betsy, your mama's done a wonder in altering that dress to fit you, hasn't she? Oh, yes. Aunt Molly, thank you. Thank you for the dress, Mama. I just want to be pretty enough for it. It was grand enough to get a new dress for Christmas, but imagine it coming up from New Orleans at that. Well, the stand does well enough when the river trade peaks to afford something special every now and then, Betsy. It was your papa's decision, after I suggested it. Then, thank you too, papa. Do you think John Barry will think I'm pretty, papa? He had better. Oh, papa. I meant, will you think I'm pretty in this dress? Betsy, you're so pretty that you make me wish I was a girl of 18, catching the eye of some young man. When John Barry sees you, he's not going to be able to think about much else. Oh, thank you for saying so, Aunt Molly. I think that's enough whimsy about it for right now. More talk like that will only irritate your papa. Not that he'd let anybody know by saying. Go and hurry your sister along, Betsy. Yes, Mama. My, but every one of them is going to be a caution today, even without meaning it. Molly, are you sure you won't come with us? It wouldn't be just to help keep a rein on the children. Betsy thinks the world of you anyway, and I know she's taken to talking to you like you were her sister and not her father's. Besides, John Barry's not the only eligible man likely to be there. Just who is talking whimsy now, Mary? 
I know I'm welcome with you and the children, but, but I'll keep William some company today. Suit yourself, Molly. But that just makes his not going all the worse. William, come away from that window now. We're almost ready. Won't you please change your mind and come along? Molly would feel free to go. And think of Betsy. She's likely to meet her future in-laws today. Don't you think her father should be there? That Barry boy can come ask my permission for Betsy's hand. I don't need to cart my whole family over his way for approval. I always supposed you liked John Barry well enough. You've hunted with him plenty of times. I never said I disliked him. Well, Betsy truly fancies him, William. She sees a lot of you in him. That's no small part of why she likes him. Well, no one could fault her for that. Well, if Betsy likes John Barry and you say you like him yourself, then why on earth won't you come with us today? I can like John Barry and still not want to be crowded by a bunch of people all day long. I'll tend to the stand. This early in the trading season, there might not be a soul on the river. That thought had crossed my mind. That's the end of it, Mary. It needs to be, William, if I'm going to get myself and the children there in time for dinner. The wagon is hitched up and out front, Mama. Archie's waiting outside for the rest of us, and uh, he wants to ride on the back gate. And he figures you'll let him if he's already on it. We'll see. Girls, we're leaving now. Betsy, get the basket then. And young Mary, you carry the pie in the front of the wagon. Away from Archie. Yes, Mama. Yes, Mama. John, come help your sisters into the wagon. Yes, Mama. John? Uh, yes, sir. You know I keep a rifle loaded under the wagon seat. Your mother's in charge today, and as the oldest boy, you are responsible. Understand me? Y yes, sir. Good. Goodbye. You all be good for your mother now. We'll see you when you get back tonight. Giddy up. Bye, Molly. Bye, Aunt Molly. Bye. Land's sake, William, what's been the matter with you? Nothing. Now, William, you know very well that you can't fool me any more than you could fool Mama. You should just see yourself. Lately, you stare out the window the way you used to whenever Papa wouldn't take you hunting. Ever since Mary and the children left, you've been pacing around like you've never been still before. Something's at you, so might as well tell me what it is. I've just been in this place too long. I'm not surprised to hear you say that again. You've said it so many times, but I can hardly say I understand why. William, you have every reason to be proud of the life you built for yourself here. You've got your home, your family, even something of a business, all on the nicest piece of land right off the river. It helps to be the first person to build if you're going to build where you like. That's another reason to be right proud, William. You were the first here. The life you built here made it possible for the other folks to build here, too. Yellow Banks has grown something considerable now, hasn't it? People still call it a community, but, but it's practically a town now. Why, it could even be called a city. Yellow Banks a city? That's just what most of the folks over at the Berry Place today are thinking. Mary's thinking the same thing, and now so are you. Please don't be angry, William. I'm not angry with you. Don't fret about that. Yellow Banks is growing, that's a fact. You make it sound like the place is growing to spite you. Maybe it is, Molly. Betsy's not the only one interested in marrying John Barry. Folks reason that matching the daughter of the first settler with the Barry name gives Yellow Banks a first family of sorts. All part of the all-fired hurry to become a city. I just don't understand, William. If a settlement becomes a city, then doesn't that show the good sense of settling that place to begin with? Aren't the people who make cities part of progress right along with you? There's something mighty nice about unsettled places, Molly. The land's more alive in those kinds of places, and you have to be more alive than it to survive, to tame the land. Then you can show it to other people and even let other folks have it because you tamed it. That's the bargain between men like me and the city-fied. My kind tames the land. Others build after us, and we move on to tame again. That's what I'm good for, or at least I used to be. A man who talks about the land like that ought to know that even the wildest vine puts roots down someplace and takes hold. Leastways, it does if it wants to live. I've been rooted to this spot for more than a decade now. Everybody around here calls me Bill Smothers. 
Bill Smothers is a husband, a father, even a neighbor. I don't know if I'm still alive enough to survive the way William Smethers used to. You're not being right to yourself, William, and you know it. You've always been as strong as you needed to be. In fact, you've been as strong as anybody needed you to be. I can't imagine what Mary and the children or Ori and James would do if not for you. Every day you have got the strength that keeps even the least of us going. I think the good Lord is at work in the bountiful strength of yours, older brother. And don't you forget that. I'm anything but an angel, Molly. I'll not apologize for doing what I thought needed doing. But it's meant being as wild as the land is at times. Don't you know why I tell the children not to drag animals out from the woods to keep around here? Yes, William. I've heard you tell them that wild things belong in the wild. Sometimes you just don't know when those wild things will turn dangerous. That's it, exactly. And that's the end of it, Molly. There's Killboat coming up from the west. Does it look like it's going to put in here? I expect it will. That's usually why they sound a horn. It'll be a while yet before they can pull over to the bank and tie off. Well, thank goodness for that. I'll need that time to get ready. Get what ready? Get the stand ready, of course. Don't bother. I can always say that the stand isn't for much but storage until later in the season. Are you going to make the first crew on the river this year unwelcome? I suppose if you were by yourself, there wouldn't be much expectation of hospitality. Men just don't have the same knack for it that women do. It's a good thing I'm here to do better. Well, that's not the way I see it right now. You've been staring down river here all day on just the chance that a boat would come along, and I've waited all day with you. Now that there's actually one out there, you mean to tell me you'd be happier if it wasn't, and I had gone with the others instead? William, what is it? Just, just call it a feeling, Molly. If that killboat's coming up from New Orleans, then the men aboard it have been on the river roughly 30 days now. That's a month removed from polite company. I've helped tend to crews of boatmen before. Not from a first boat, you haven't. Now, crews coming in early can be rowdier because they don't have the other traffic to make them get on about their business and be on their way. That's why I have John and James here help me with the stand until boats start coming back down from Pittsburgh and Louisville. But William, it's still February, and as you say, it's a long trip. Those men coming in off the river, I, I think they'd be feeling the cold more than anything else. I'll just go stoke the fire in the stand stove, that's all. All right, Molly, but promise me that you won't stay long after they've had their chance to come in and get warm. They won't likely tarry long if you go. Where would I need to go, and what would I tell someone once I got there? You go on up to Felty Huss's place. You can turn right around and come back once you get there if you like. That boat will be on its way by the time you get back. Uh, promise me you'll go, Molly. All right, I promise, William. Now, play, may I please go to get the stand warmed up? All right, go ahead. I'll meet whoever comes up and bring them over directly if there's a need to. Any help on the river today? Ahoy, Yellow Banks! Ahoy! Hello, Killboat! Where are you up from? We're up from New Orleans and headed for Louisville. Can we put in here for repairs and provisions, Yellow Banks? Suit yourselves, Killboat. Take the path up the bank here when you make the shore. Much obliged, Yellow Banks. Gougers, pull for that dock. Four, five, six. Seven of them. Might as well count that big fella twice. So this is Yellow Banks, eh? It is. Not much to it. I never said there was. There's all kinds of places on the river, boys. I suppose they can't all be Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> My name's Norris. Are you Smothers? Uh, the name is Smothers, but say it as you like for all the difference it makes you. Uh, is that your killboat, Norris? She's mine from fore to aft. There's not much to it either. Hey. Hey, hey. The, come on. Now the lover's got some nerve to talk down, seeing as he's all by himself. That bumpkin's flying his flag a mite high. He needs to be lowered a few hands, I'd say. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, friend. 
Now, don't be riled at Mr. Smethers here, boys. I like him. Excuse the offense, friend. No offense taken. Well, I'm glad to know that, friend. Is that, that the stand over there? It is. Well, I think I see smoke from a stovepipe. So there's a fire going. There is. Do you mind if we warm ourselves a bit before we do some business? All right. Follow me. Lead the way, friend. Say <sighs> there, Smothers. You weren't expecting company today. Local company, I mean. And that's no concern of yours, Norris. Well, I only ask because it sure smells like somebody's cooking something mighty good up that way. My crew and I wouldn't want to intrude on any social occasion of yours. I smell it too, Captain. Though I can hardly believe it. It's been so long, but that's the smell of bacon. Someone's frying bacon. I can almost taste it from here. They have no idea what that would mean to me. Well, I sure know what it means to me. Cooking that smells like that means there's women around here. At least one of them. Molly, what are you doing? Are you saying something, friend? Uh, never mind. Wait out here while I go in and have a look at what I have stocked up. If, you, if I haven't got the goods to supply an outfit as big as yours, Norris, that can't be helped. And there's always a stand... Good the afternoon, gentlemen! Welcome to Yellow Banks. Goodness, William, you met a bunch down there, didn't you? Great day in the morning. Dirk was right. There are women here. Uh, uh, hold off, you unseasoned pup. I mean, when there's only one of them, and that one's as prim as she looks, then the only thing to be calling her is an angel. Right, Captain? Now, boys, show some manners when there's obviously a lady before us. Good afternoon to you, too, ma'am. Yellow Banks looks better every passing minute. I'm Captain Andrew Norris of New Orleans. It would be a true pleasure to make your acquaintance. It's a pleasure to be sure, Captain Norris, but I believe it's mine. Oh, you're far too kind, ma'am. I was just telling your husband how we hoped we weren't interrupting the meal you're fixing. Captain Norris, my brother and I ate our lunch some time ago. He's had the task of, of keeping you company so I could fix something for you, for all of you, as a token of hospitality. It's nothing special, but, but it's ready now. Please come inside and enjoy it, won't you? There's not much like home cooking to remind a river man of home. We'd all be much obliged, ma'am. You would only be most welcome, Captain Norris. And my name is Molly. Miss Molly Smithers. So call me Molly. Well, then, Molly, please call me Andrew. How nice. Well, then, Andrew, please bring your crew inside. The only good thing here is that it's been a while since we ate, the way my stomach is about turned now. And no more shenanigans, Molly. Just see that you remember your promise and go as soon as you can, do you hear? William Smithers, I always keep my promises, and you know that. These men have been perfectly nice. Goodness, but do you always have to be so suspicious? Only if I want to survive from one day to the next, Molly, you'd be well to remember that too. And that's when the preacher turns to me and says, I'm not going to tell if you don't. Ah! <laughs> oh, my word, Andrew. We don't often hear stories like that here in Yellow Banks. Uh, truth be told, Miss Molly, uh, we haven't heard that story told quite like that before ourselves. Well, what Snags means is that I spruced up the language a bit. Present company considered, Molly. Well, you're blushing. I hope I haven't offended you after all. No, Andrew. It's just very sweet of you con to consider me that way. Few things could have been nicer. Yes, like not telling that story in the first place. Can I get anyone another biscuit? That pan will have some more warmed through by now. Oh, I can't remember tasting anything so good. Biscuits with bacon and molasses. If I'm dreaming, then no one best wake me before I get my second helping. I'm partial to this hot spice cider for washing it all down. I'd have more of that if it's no trouble, Miss Molly. Of course you may. It's no trouble at all. 
I'd like some more of it too, but uh, could you spice it up with something that has a stronger kick to it than cider, <laughs> if you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sure all oh, yeah. you gentlemen could handle something stronger than cider, but I hope you won't mind if th- uh, that's all I serve today. I'm sure there's a lot more work to be done once you're back about the keel boat. I'm just as sure that such an able crew will want to be at its best. Oh. Now, boys, Miss Molly's been very kind to us today. We are guests of hers, and her brother, of course. She also happens to be right. I always want my crew at its best, and that's why I have the best crew. Besides, this is as much a party as I can think of. We have good company, good food, and good drink. All we need now is some music. Miss Molly, would you allow us to thank you with a song? That would be lovely, Andrew. From what I've heard in seasons past, boatmen can carry a tune very well. That's very true, Molly. And that's a big part of the reason I have certain men in my crew. Mr. Bateau, did you bring your squeeze box ashore with you? She's right here. (laughs) Then let's hear the song the crew knows. Make it something bright and peppy in honor of Miss Molly. Aye, aye, Captain. We all know this one. So, Cordell, you start us off. The boatman is a lucky man, none can do as the boatman can. The boatman dance and the boatman sing, the boatman's up to everything. Hi ho, the way we go, floating down the Ohio. When the boatman goes on shore, look, old man, and mind your store. Seals your sheep and seals your show. Binds them up and puts them in the boat. Hi ho, the way we go, floating down the Ohio. Uh, when the boatman goes on shore, he spends his money and he works so hard. Never see the last of my life. Who would be a boatman's wife? Hi ho, the way we go, floating down the Ohio. Mr. Bateau, and perhaps Miss Molly will care to dance with me. Let's hear that verse, last verse again, boys. When the boatman goes on shore, spends his money and works for more. Never seen a last in my life that would be a boatman's wife. I hold the way we go, floating down the Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough now, Norris. Why don't we let the lady decide that, friend? She's my sister, and no concern of yours. Her hospitality's overdone, though she means well. Don't take it for what it's not, Norris. She's not interested in the likes of you that way. Do you hear that? The likes of you? You best tie off fast, Smithers, because you're drifting hard for a scrap. No man talks to our captain that way. Not if he wants all the parts of his face to stay in the right order. Ah, now cool your heels, both of you. For Miss Molly's sake, the lubber may have a fool's gumption, but it's captain's to answer. Smithers, I warn you that the captain enjoys a fight and often gets paid to prove it. I've not seen a man best him. Well, Snags is right, friend. Fella has to wait to make a living when it's not trading season. The money is good, but the winning is better. I don't like to lose, so I don't lose. But friend, I'm in a good mood today. So please don't take it wrong if I just go ahead and ask Miss Molly herself if she's interested. Andrew, I, I, I'm sorry. I never intended to give you the wrong impression, but I'm afraid I've started to. There's certainly nothing wrong with you or the likes of boatmen. I'm more than a mite settled about my life right now, that's all. My brother doesn't have cause to carry on so about me, but he is right that I only wanted to make you and your crew welcome today. Now, I hope all you gentlemen will excuse me, but I've been forgetting a chore I promised a neighbor as a favor. I really can't put it off any longer. Please, just leave the dishes and things where they are. I can tidy up when I get back. William, you'll see to the supplies that Captain Norris and his crew came for, won't you? That is why they stopped, Molly, yes. Good. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Andrew, you do understand, don't you? Molly, of course I understand this perfectly. Thank you for today, and until next we meet. Yes. Don't be a stranger during trading season. None of you. Goodbye. Now, I'll give everyone a little time to concentrate on what your keelboat needs to move on from here as soon as possible. 
When you've got an idea of those supplies among you, then you can come up here to the counter. Uh, well, as you know, that's the way it goes, boys. It's feast or famine for the boatmen. Like it or not, we need plenty of what Smithers has got here. Captain Cordell and Skiff can help me get the supplies aboard. Vito as well. Well, see to it, Snags. Come on, you lot. I'll go down and have the rest of the crew prepare to stow the supplies and shove off, Captain. The sooner the better, if you ask me. Well, you can stay here, Hawser. I'll go. Be sure to give friend Smithers as much business as possible. Uh, what do I tell Smithers if he asks where you went? Well, I'm tending to my keelboat. And besides, we need all the supplies the Snags thinks we do. I'll need more money than I have on me to pay for it all. He'll have to settle for that explanation until I come back to settle with him. All right, Smithers. When Snags there is done being quartermaster for the crew, I'll be looking to buy me some of your fine Kentucky tobacco. I have it, but it does fetch a price this time of year. Hey, where'd your captain go? Captain Norris has gone back to the boat to see that it's ready for these supplies. He didn't send one of you to see to that? Not that it's your concern, Smithers, but the captain went to fetch more of his money. That he don't leave to anyone else to see to. The captain will be back to settle his accounts with you. I'm glad to know that. If there's one thing the trading business has made me fond of, it's settling accounts. I'll be happy to settle with you, Captain. Of all the nonsense, William, do you have to make so sure that I actually go all the way to Felty's that you need to carry me the rest of the way? <laughs> well, that's not what I had in mind coming out here, but carrying you off is an appealing idea. Oh, it, it's you, Andrew. I thought it must be my brother not satisfied enough with me being right about me, and, and please just never mind the rest. William means well. Well, a boatman knows the feel of cold water when someone's trying to douse him with it, Molly. And your brother was drawing plenty of it from that mean well of his. Let him supply my men, and you can supply my claim from our dance back there. What you really need is a man to set off that smoldering fire behind your warmth, don't you? I claim I saw that right enough in you, didn't I? Big brother isn't here to make an old maid of you now. So tell the truth, pretty Molly. Andrew, Captain Norris, I'm flattered and mortified all at once to hear just how badly you misunderstood my intentions today, particularly towards you. I truly meant nothing more or less than making the highest ideal of Christian hospitality available. I overdid myself, partly despite William's stubbornness, but more refreshed by the adventure of it all than anything else. I never thought to mislead you about anything so fanciful as you staying on here with me or me heading out with you. Again, I'm sorry if I gave you the wrong impression, but I'm honestly settled in my life. At least we've had today's pleasant acquaintance. Now goodbye, Captain Norris. Not so fast, pretty Molly. Captain Norris, stand aside, please. My brother will soon have your crew outfitted back that way. I'm on an errand along the path ahead. There really is nothing more I can do for you here in Yellowbanks. Really. So if you'll excuse me. No, no, please, Miss Molly. Oh, very well. We must part this way, then at least give me your hands in the affectionate parting of cordial friends. Won't you do that for me, please? There. Thank you. Ah, oh, the dear settled hands of Miss Molly and the adventurous hands of Captain Andrew Norris. Your hands are those of a woman, after all, Molly, and mine are those of a man. Pretty sure my hands are powerful enough to hold you as close as I like. Captain Norris, please stop this and let go now. My wrists are starting to hurt. Well, this close to me. Think you can listen better, Molly. Think you can listen to how if anyone misunderstood today it was you. I know what I saw and what my crew saw. You wanted me to claim you. 
But you didn't say so then under the eyes of so many, especially your Andrew, brother. you're scaring me. You're hurting me. Well, it doesn't have to be anything frightening, pretty Molly. After all, there's a lot of adventurous ground to cover between completely wild and completely unsettled. I said stop it. I said let go. No, you don't. <laughs> Friend Smithers, are you home? I came to square the bill with you at the stand and found it shut tight. This gives me no choice but to come calling on you here, friend. Unless supplying my keelboat is just some of your good hospitality. I've got your bill ready, Norris, for a fact. Now, if you want to make it good, like a man, here's what you're going to do. First, you open that door, good and wide. Let me see that it's just you I'm dealing with. Then come inside and close the door behind you. Well, I'm only happy to oblige you, friend. I've had your particular clod of earth here under my feet for far too long already today. You've just been the price of doing business on the river, I suppose. So, uh, you gonna hand me the bill like a man? Or do I have to come clear across this room to get it? It's far enough into my home, Norris. The bill's on the side table over to your right. Pick it up, put your payment down, and get out. Oh, I'll look over the cost first. Nobody decides where my money lands but me. You're charging for the food and drink that Miss Molly offered us at your stand? All the nerve. That was your sister's token of hospitality, and you know it. She was too free with her hospitality, and that's her account. But my food and drink you pay for. Well, it'd be mighty unpleasant to lose business when other crews hear about ill treatment, Smethers. And much the same for an ill-mannered keelboat captain apt to find his crew turned away when he gets told he doesn't behave properly around a woman. And now mind your distance there, Norse. There it is at last. I charm Miss Molly, even though you didn't want her to listen. And you can't stand that I bested you in her interest. Now, I warned you plain enough about closing in. I, now I'm telling you not to talk about my sister like that. Don't even speak her name. Though it took her long enough, she turned you away. I'm giving you one last chance, Boatman. Pay that bill, then get your oily charm, your song and dance, and your wicked stories off my ground. Do that while you still have your puffed up pride to float you. Or what, Smethers? You might have been something fearsome once. Fifteen, even ten years ago. I take on better frontier types than you all the time, and I tear them apart. I enjoy it. You're a lumpy shopkeeper now, Smethers. What do you think I'd be afraid of you doing? It might be that this shopkeeper is about to thrash all the keelboat tar out of you. Go ahead and try it, fool. I'll beat you senseless in your own home. I'll... you... Molly! Oh, William! William! You mongrel from hell! <laughs> Not so fast, shopkeeper! whoever you are. It's still pitch dark out and a decent body is trying to sleep here. It's William Smathers from Yellowbanks. Open the door, Squire Duncan. What on earth are you doing here at this hour? I know you only address me formally when you want me to mitigate petty squabbles over small sums. Well, come back after sunrise and well past it at that. I'll be much more agreeable toward hearing disputes when I've had a full night of undisturbed rest. If somebody owes you money or you owe somebody money, it will have to wait until then. Ben, there is a man lying dead at my place. A boatman. His crew thinks I murdered him. They'll be on my trail over here soon enough if they aren't already. Let me come in. Ben, please. Good heavens, William. A man is dead? Who is, or, or rather, who was he? Uh, here, I'll light another lantern. The lantern you have is all the light I want right now. This man, he was a keelboat captain from New Orleans. His name is Norris. 
And do these others pursuing you, the dead man's crew, have reason to believe that you murdered him? They think I do. This boatman and I were at odds from the time he showed up late this afternoon. But, uh, but none of them know how Norris met his end, for a fact. None of the, his crew saw the fight. So you fought with this man, Norris? I, I did. I don't deny it, Ben. So this Norris died from fighting you, with you? The knife had more to do with him dying than I did. What knife? It was his knife, not mine. We were locked in with each other pretty fierce, and somehow this knife come out. All I wanted to do was get it away from me before he stuck me with it. The next thing I know, Norris is somehow stabbed. Twice. Are you telling me that you somehow stabbed him in self-defense? Twice? Or that he somehow accidentally stabbed himself twice? Resulting in his death? What I'm saying is that he's dead, and there's a lynch mob of boatmen coming after me who... They'll be here any minute, and I don't have time for your infernal questions right now, Ben. Felty Husk is rallying some friends to help me fend off the mob. They should be able to be here before Norris's crew does. I need your rifle, Ben, just in case the Yellow Banks men are, are the ones later than soon. No. Look, if these keelboat men do arrive here before your friends from Yellow Banks, then I'll have to be the one to keep them at bay long enough to reason with them. You're not handy with a rifle, Ben. You, you can't bluff men like these, and nobody could reason with them. They're dangerous. Just, just give me a rifle. Look, I may not be much with a firearm, but I am the justice of the peace. A man has died by uncertain circumstances that some consider murder in my jurisdiction. It's likely they'll bring that charge against you. I can't allow you to use my rifle, or any other for that matter. I, I don't know if you thought you and your friends could garrison yourselves in my home only to outgun the keelboat crew into leaving and then be done with it. <clears throat> Well, that will not happen here. William Smethers, by coming here, you have effected your surrender to me on the suspicion of murder. Is that understood? Ben, I said no, I... No, sir, I said is that understood? All right, yes, it's understood. Now, please, dim that light. I suppose I'm under arrest now. No, William, you're in protective custody right now. I can't actually arrest you until the charge is brought. No offense, Ben, but I don't feel very protected without a rifle in my hands right now. Well, you'll have to rely on others like me to protect you. But you stay right there. Now, if there's a rifle needed, I've got it. But I'm the justice of the peace, and you're my prisoner, and we will settle this according to the law. I had hoped that you would answer some more of my infernal questions. That's fine advice, Ben. Have your letter of the law. I just hope you don't get the both of us killed. Will the men from Yellow Banks arrive in time to save William from the angry boatman? Will the hangman have his way, even if they do? Tune in next time for the answers to these and other questions. You've been listening to the Trinity Radio Players production of Murder at Yellow Banks. Starring Jeremiah Henson as William Smethers with Mike Quigg, Terry Crow, Ava Lanham, Maddox Meyer, Winston Hulsey, Trinity Moore, Jennifer Hendricks Wright, Troy Duncan, Pablo Gashastegi, Adam Pryor, J.C. White, Mark Payne, Robert Zambrano, Jim Payne, Gray Hurt, Brian Smith, Peter Hall, George Hall, Brett Mills, Joe Barry, and Reed Roberts and featuring Foley sound effects by Tony Brewer. Incidental music provided by Evelyn Champion, with accordion music by Mr. James Wells. Produced by our friends at Tinkertone Studios, engineered and edited by Shane Devon. The Trinity Radio Players are brought to you by our sponsors, Greenwell Chisholm. See Greenwell Chisholm for all your printing and promotional needs. And by Limestone Bank, a firm financial future starts here. And the Kentucky Arts Council, the state arts agency providing American Rescue Plan funds to Theater Workshop of Owensboro, Inc., with federal funding from the National Endowment for the Arts. Goodbye until next time.